say welcome to everyone. I, as Kathleen just pointed out, it seems like we've got quite a lot of people from outside of Bristol this, this month, which is great. So welcome, this is the, the Bristol Biodesign uh, International Webinar Series. And today I'm really excited because we've, we've got not one talk, we've actually got three talks covering a whole range of exciting kind of developments in plant synthetic biology. So from some aspects of genome engineering all the way through to controlling development. So I'm really excited to hear about all these different things that are, that are going on. I'm also joined by Emily Larson today, who's gonna be helping me chair some of the questions. And to give you an idea of the format, um, the speakers are gonna give their talks. And then at the end, uh, myself and Emily are gonna basically field your questions to them. So if you wanna ask a question, we have a, a separate website that you can go to and actually um, post your, your question. And that's a, a website called Slido. So you can either search for that on Google or I'm just gonna paste in the web address into the, um, into the chat now. If you go to that website, you'll be asked for a number. And the number for this meeting is um, 45274. And then what you'll be taken to is basically a, uh, like a, a list of questions and you can at the top you can add a new one. Uh, you can also upvote questions so use that as an opportunity to kind of there's something you, you also think it'd be really nice to know that upvote it and we'll try and we'll try our best to sift through those and and, um, and make sure that they're, they're asked to the speakers. I'll also try and pick out one of those at the end of each talk so that um, we can sort of like directly address maybe some more technical things in, in the talks themselves. Um, and I think I think that's everything. So rather than waste any more time of me talking, I'll I'll start by introducing the the first speaker, which is Quinton Dudley. So Quinton Dudley is a, a postdoctoral researcher currently at the Earlham Institute and the John Innes Centre in the UK. Um, but prior to that, he did his bachelor's degree actually in the US at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, and then moved on to do his, his doctorate at the Northwestern University, uh, obviously in Chicago, in the, the lab of Michael Jewett. Um, when he was at Northwestern, he actually developed a number of different techniques. So one of these is, is known as IPRO, which is a cell-free method for probing metabolic pathways, and something called COA-SAMID, um, which is a high-throughput technique for, for quantifying COA-bound metabolites. Um, at the moment, he's working as a postdoc with Nicola Patron and Sarah O'Connor, and he's working on effectively engineering wild tobacco strains as kind of a, a bioproduction platform. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to you, Quinton, and I'll let you take it away. Hey, thanks so much. Let me get my slides here. Can, can you see my slides? Uh, yep, yeah, looks good. Okay. No, thanks, Tom, so much for the introduction. And again, uh, my name is Quentin, coming to you from Norwich. Um, and uh, so today I'd like to talk to you about my work on engineering plants to actually produce uh, high value metabolites. Um, and so again, this is a collaboration between two different research groups, uh, Nicola's, Nicola Patron's group at the Earlham Institute, and then Sarah O'Connor's lab, um, and she was at the John Innes, uh, but then has recently relocated to the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Jena, Germany. So by way of introduction, um, plants produce a variety of unique metabolites useful to humans. Um, and examples include treatments for heart conditions and pain, uh, medicines for cancer or malaria, uh, as well as a diversity of vitamins, insecticides, and materials. So our goal as plant synthetic biologists and engineers is to leverage this incredible metabolic diversity to make improved medicines in high quantities on demand. So the specific plant metabolite that I've been focusing on in this project is the cancer drug vinblastin. So it's a potent microtube inhibitor and used for the treatment of lymphomas and other cancers, and is naturally produced by Catharanthus roseus, also known as the Madagascar periwinkle. Um, but Catharanthus only synthesizes really tiny amounts of vinblastin, only 0.0002% fresh weight. Um, and the complex chemical structure of vinblastin makes chemical synthesis practically impossible. So we would like to increase our manufacturing capability for this drug using biology. And so to do this, uh, we first need to understand how Catharanthus actually makes this molecule. And a tremendous effort in the last 20 years has gone into elucidating the 29-step biosynthesis pathway, 
uh, with the O'Connor lab discovering the last three missing enzymes in 2018. But however, the engineering efforts in my project have really focused on the early parts of the pathway with the goal of producing higher levels of the precursor molecule streptosidine, uh, colored here in yellow. So uh, streptosidine would be uh, an ideal thing to make at this starting venue because it's, a, it's kind of the common branch point for this class of molecule called monoterpene indole alkaloids. There are over 3,000 different ones uh, made by thousands of plant species. And you can see here, there's a range of, of medical applications. So the overall goal of this project is to uh, increase streptosidine production in the plant. The challenge is Catharanthus roseus itself is extremely difficult to transform and manipulate. So we chose instead to rebuild the pathway in a wild tobacco relative uh, called Nicotiana benthamiana. So benthamiana has been used for years studying plant pathogen interactions, but it's also a powerful chassis for pathway reconstitution. So what you can do is by syringe infiltrating a leaf with a shuttle bacteria containing a gene of interest, you can bypass uh, benthamiana's weak immune system and produce high level gene expression just five days later. And this is also scalable. So if you grow uh, glass houses full of these things, um, you can actually produce high level proteins. Um, and there's been some companies uh, interested in this for medical applications to make vaccines, including um, one that's uh, in phase two trials as a COVID vaccine. Um, but if instead of expressing vaccine candidates uh, genes, you put your, the enzymes of your metabolic pathway, uh, you can take advantage of the fact that the, this plant is already making high levels of the precursor metabolites that already has the ability to fold these proteins uh, and some helper enzymes to reconstitute metabolic pathways. And this has been enabled production of dozens of different metabolites in the plant with a range of useful activities. However, there's a challenge uh, to doing this in benthamiana, and that is the tendency for this wild tobacco to derivatize foreign metabolites by adding glutathione, uh, as well as over-oxidizing, over-glycosylating, and acylating uh, your pathway molecules. So we and others uh, see many peaks on LCMS chromatograms rather than seeing just a single product. So for example, if you add the enzymes to make just the first, first molecule, geraniol, you're already producing dozens of extra peaks with, you know, for example, these two showing extra hexose groups and this blue peak showing over-oxidation to geranic acid. So one strategy to increase flux through the pathway in tobacco is to identify these enzymes and knock them out using a CRISPR-Cas nucleus. And based on the types of modifications we see, we can hypothesize which enzyme classes are responsible, uh, sh shown here. So glutathione transferases, cytochrome P450s, or glycosyl transferases. But we really needed more experimental data be able to make an educated hypothesis about which of the hundreds of possible candidate genes would be good ones to knock out. And for this, we used transcriptomics, phylogenetics, and some in vitro activity screening. So to start with um, our, our transcriptomics, we ran a large RNA sequencing experiment um, where we had four different conditions um, on uninfiltrated wild type. Um, let me grab my pointer here. Um, a, a condition where we're just infiltrating GFP, and then two other conditions where we're having the plant accumulate these metabolites. And you can see for this candidate, uh, glutathione transferase, you know, the, the plant doesn't seem to be responding. But for this GST30, um, it's only upregulating this molecule or this, this gene in the presence of this metabolite. So our hypothesis is that by actively responding, um, we can, uh, or the plant actively responding to this metabolite, that, that might give an indication that this is, this is the one actually uh, doing the derivatization. So our, our second approach has been to use phylogenetics. Um, so we've done a number of different phylogenetic analyses uh, of the, the benthamiana enzymes, along with some more better characterized ones. Um, and you can see that, for example, the cytochrome P450s, uh, I've marked the pathway enzymes that are already part of the pathway and so we've, we've selected candidate P450s from benthamiana that are closely related to some of these P450s early uh, in, in the pathway to streptosine. And we've done the same thing for the glycosyl transferases, but we've been able to take advantage of some literature data uh, where there's known enzymes, for example, in Arabidopsis and a handful in benthamiana. These are marked by purple and blue stars, um, which are known to act on geraniol, an early metabolite in the pathway. And so um, these also might be good ones for knockout. 
And we've also done some in vitro activity screening on our own. And again, the numbers got kind of big with so many candidate enzymes. So we actually used a, a technique called cell-free protein synthesis, um, where you actually lyse a bacteria, lysate in this case, and that contains the transcription and translation machinery that can work in a test tube as long as you're adding amino acid and NTP substrates and ATP source, and then a DNA template. And so um, you can make high levels of protein then in the test tube. Um, and so uh, the challenge was this approach wasn't necessarily optimized for plants. So we've been working with the Earlham uh, Institute Biofoundry uh, and their high throughput, high throughput liquid handling resources um, to uh, develop a cell-free pipeline for expressing plant proteins. And uh, so looking at, for example, these glycosyl transferases, we've tested a number of different N-terminal tags so that we can optimize expression. And then uh, once we've found the, the best expression conditions, we show that we can feed the substrates, uh, in this case, tranial or nepetalactol, and C, convert uh, glycosylation without then needing to go through the effort of protein purification. So at this point, we have uh, 32 different candidate genes um, that we've divided into 13 different lines, and we're, we're well along our way of using then uh, a Cas9 nucleus to knock those out. Um, and so just for example, you know, kind of what you see, uh, 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 you know, a, a, a single line, maybe a third of our plants are well mutated. So as we're in the process of testing these for derivatization, again, the overall goal of the project has been to produce tryptostein. I want to talk about a second aspect of the project as I finish up here um, about how to increase pathway flux, not by deleting enzymes, but by adding them in. So the state of the art for this um, uh, reconstitution pathway was published in 2014, and they split the pathway into two parts, um, these yellow and green enzymes to make an intermediate 7-DLA, and then actually feeding an intermediate uh, to get the rest of the pathway. So the O'Connor lab has actually been studying a different set of plants uh, known as catnip. And so they make a number of iridoids uh, pictured here, which are responsible for the euphoric uh, effect of catnip on, on cats. And so in the, in the process of studying that, we now have some new enzyme candidates that actually accelerate a key step in the metabolic pathway. So we hypothesized that by supplementing this MLPL enzyme from uh, Nepita Mussini, uh, to our pathway reconstitution, we could accelerate this step and potentially get all the way to strictosine in a single plant. And that uh, hypothesis actually then proved to be true. Um, so uh, we began reconstituting the pathway uh, with here uh, enzymes one, two, and three. And you see you know, some of these derivatives I talked about. Um, but if you are uh, trying to make this intermediate 7 DLA, uh, only in the presence of that helper MLPL enzyme do we see uh, accumulation of that peak. And so, um, excitingly, you know, if you then add the MLPL enzyme uh, along with the remaining pathway enzymes to get all the way to sucrosine, um, we can uh, see a, a single peak that matches the mass and retention time of the known sucrosine standard. So, um, Finish up here, I'll just conclude that uh, I've showed you today um, our pipeline for selecting knockout candidates. And uh, uh, hopefully soon we'll have uh, some characterization of these knockout plants. Um, also how that uh, supplementing enzymes from catmint can increase flux through the pathway. And, and we're looking forward to, to collecting this, this up, uh, upcoming data. So all of this work uh, uh, is uh, a group effort, and I'd like to thank all the people on the Patreon and on Connor Labs and our funding resources. Thanks. Thanks very much, Quinton. That's really interesting work. So I have, I have one quick question on Slido that's been pushed up to the top. So the, the top question is, how reproducible are these transient plant-based expression approaches? And are, is there large plant-to-plant -plant variability in, when producing these proteins and products? Um. So there's, there's definitely within leaf variation um, for you know, your expression level at, at a given, uh, uh, in a given leaf spot. And so that's definitely kind of a, a, a thing you kind of have to take into account when you're running these, these experiments, you know, multiple leaves, multiple plants. Um, but uh, I'd say you know, it, it depends on, on your goal. I think you know, we're starting to see some companies uh, that, are, that are taking on this technology to actually uh, to make this at scale. 
Um, so yeah, there's some variability, but it's definitely um, something that I think we can continue to overcome, um, maybe with some genome engineering efforts uh, beyond the scope of this project. That's cool. Sounds awesome. Okay, so I'd suggest that anyone else has any questions, keep posting them into the, the slider and then we'll, we'll come back to them at the end. So thanks again very much, Quentin. So the, the next speaker is F.D. Frank Gifkatis um, from Cambridge, uh, who's working with uh, Jim Hasselhoff, I think it was part of the Open Plant Project. Um, prior to that, he did a, an undergraduate in Greece at the University of Crete which he's told me to advertise. Obviously, Greece is a beautiful place. Garland and Crete is lovely as well. Um, after that, he then moved to the University of Oxford to study for his PhD and did a, a year in Japan at the University of Tokyo before returning to the UK to his, his current position. And um, today he's going to be telling us a little bit about a, a kind of an emerging model system, I guess, for, for plant synthetic biology. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll hand straight over to you, Effie. Thanks a lot, Tom, for the invitation and the introduction and the opportunity to present our work. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Uh, yes, that's perfect. So, Today I'm going to talk about the work we're doing here in Cambridge in Open Plant. And uh, I would start by just introducing a little bit about plant and synthetic biology. So plants are very attractive. They have a series of characteristics that make them very attractive for synthetic biology, such as uh, the ability to make their own food using sunlight, the ability to grow in a very large scale, and uh, plasticity. And as we've seen in the previous talk, they have very extensive uh, metabolic pathways that can be exploited. Plants also have organelles that are called chloroplasts, and it's where photosynthesis occurs, that in their turn, they're also very attractive uh, systems for synthetic biology because they have, again, a series of characteristics, such as a small uh, of prokaryotic nature genome, they can perform homologous recombination similar to yeast. And importantly, you can use chloroplasts to express a, a transgene in very, very high levels. So here in Open Plant, we believe that uh, there is a need of uh, simple and rapid uh, plant systems for synthetic biology to complement and expand the work that uh, has been done on uh, more co complex systems, such as crops or nicotiana that we've seen again in the previous talk. And we've selected a bryophyte that is called Marcantia, and you can see here. And the main reason can be summarized with a word. It's very simple. It has a relatively fast life cycle. It's very easy to culture. As you can see, it can grow on the pavement. It has a fantastic regenerative capacity. You cut a small bit and then it grows again. And it's one of the few plant, the plants that you can uh, both genetic manipulate the chloroplast genome and the nuclear genome. Also the dominant life, uh, uh, the, the dominant phase of the life cycle is haploid, which makes genetic analysis very simple. And it has also this beautiful structures that you can see here and a magnification you can see here that are called gemma cups that produce these uh, tiny uh, small plants that look like crisps and they are called gemma and gemma are, sorry, Gemma are clonal propagules, and they are very useful, very scientifically tasty because they're flat, they can be easily imaged, and you can very nicely follow the development, their development, as I will explain later. So our first aim was to optimize and standardize the tools that were available for work on Mercantia. And we, today I'm going to just uh, talk about uh, our work on uh, DNA construct generation, culture, transformation, imaging. And then I will give you a couple of uh, examples of how we have started using those tools. And at the end, we have a surprise guest. So we, for construct generation for Mercanti applications, we adopted a type 2S uh, cloning system. So type 2 cloning systems are like coronavirus. They really expand everywhere. And there is always a new variant. And our local variant was developed by Bernardo Pollack, who was a PhD student. 
And one of the, the key benefits of uh, the local variant of type 2S cloning system that we call loop assembly is that it only needs eight vectors. And we also start using these boxes to grow plants that are like small greenhouses where you can have the whole plant, the entire life cycle of the plant uh, in sterile conditions and without the need of too much water. Then we can uh, produce a construct with, uh, within one or two weeks and then we can transform the plant, either the nuclear genome or the chloroplast genome. We can have plants uh, that have their chloroplast genome transformed within eight weeks, which is very short in comparison to other systems, or just two weeks for the nuclear genome using, using spores that are producing these boxes. So the other thing we did was to expand the loop assembly and uh, generate new vectors for, again, nuclear chloroplast and CRISPR-Cas9 editing, and also make an extensive library of uh, level zero parts. We call this system now Open Plan Kit. And this uh, library of uh, level zero parts has also fluorescent proteins for multispectral imaging. And talking about imaging, we also developed a semi high throughput imaging uh, pipeline that uh, we use Gemma. And we can put many Gemma on a multi well plate filled with media. And then we can image many lines simultaneously. And I will explain later why this is very useful. And uh, Gemma are very photogenic. As you can see here, uh, we have a Gemma that has uh, the uh, cell membrane marked with the fluorescent protein and the, nuclear, the nuclei mapped with another fluorescent protein. And you can use this Gemma to make a time lapse and you can follow development, for example, that is very useful. So now I'm gonna to move to a couple of examples of how we've started using those tools. So when you uh, engineer uh, multicellular organisms, one of the things you want to do among many others is to target expression in specific cell types. And in the case of Marcantia, uh, we don't really uh, understand much about how uh, cell specific expression is regulated. And to overcome this limitation, what we did, we took uh, almost all the transcription factors of the plant that are around 398. And then we used the open plant kit to generate uh, uh, promoter fluorescent protein fusions, transform the plant, and then use the image pipeline I described earlier to uh, screen all these uh, uh, plants. And that allowed us to start identifying promoter regions that can uh, regulate expression specifically in specific cell types. And what you can see here is uh, an example of a promoter uh, fluorescent protein fusion that uh, regulates expression specifically in this area of the plant, which is the area that most of the growth occurs. And this is another example of uh, another promoter region that can regulate expression specifically in the rhizoids that are root-like structures in Marcantia. Now, the second example uh, I want to talk about uh, has to do with the chloroplasts. And as I said in the introduction, chloroplasts can be very useful for expressing uh, transgenes in very high levels. <clears throat> However, there was a limitation in Marcantia that uh, we couldn't achieve these high levels of expression. And to solve this problem, what we did was to explore the potential of some sequences sequences in the chloroplast genome that are bound by specific factors and uh, these factors protects these sequences in the transcripts from action nuclease activity so what we did was we obtained 51 new bryophyte chloroplast plastid genomes and uh, we uh, based on comparison of the sequences we could identify candidate regions that could be used to get fused with a gene we want to express in the chloroplast and achieve high levels of expression. And again, using the open plan kit, we uh, tested several candidates. And here I saw an example of uh, such a region that when you fuse uh, before a gene, in this case, a fluorescent protein and drive with a chloroplast promoter, you can achieve very, very high levels of expression. And this system now is further explored by a student in our lab, uh, Zewai. 
And what she tries to do is try to express uh, uh, compounds that are of uh, industrial interest, such as nanobodies. And I would like to invite today's guest in our talk, which is Homewards. Homewards is another bryophyte. And together with Keiko, Peter, Feiwei, and Manuel, we have uh, established a new model system. And the reason why I talk uh, about Homewards in a synthetic biology uh, talk is that in their chloroplast that you can see here, they have a special structure that is called pyrenoid, which is a carbon concentrating uh, mechanism, mediates a carbon concentrating mechanism and has the potential to be engineered in crops and increase photosynthetic efficiency. And with that, I finished my talk and I would like to thank all the people in the open plant uh, lab here in Cambridge, especially Susanna, Linda, Marta and Marius. And I would like also to highlight that the tools I described today are free and are distributed by Agin, and all the protocols can be found in protocols IO. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ati. Some, some beautiful stuff. I never thought a plant could look cute, but it was kind of cute with little horns at the end. I thought that was really, that was really, really nice, I have to say. So I've got one, one quick question for you that I've, I've seen has been upvoted. So when you were doing the sort of the transcription factor screen, were there any transcription factors that just didn't express at all? And yeah, how many sorts of cell types are you expecting to see in, in this organism? So we don't have so many cell types. Mm -hmm. And uh, from, uh, of course, uh, from the initial screen, so we haven't screened everything. We have screened about uh, like 50 or 70 so far. And uh, a common thing is that most of the stuff is expressed in many, many cell types. So still, it's a very preliminary and under development uh, project. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so our, our final speaker today is Jen Brophy. So Jen is a, uh, well, she's going to be very soon an assistant professor of bioengineering at Stanford University. Um, she's setting up a group in September this year. Um, and she'll be focusing on kind of reverse or engineering plants form and function. Um, prior to that, she received her bachelor's from UC Berkeley and then went on to work with Chris Voigt and Alan Grossman at MIT on um, developing tools for working with undomesticated bacteria and modifying soil microbiomes in situ. Uh, and then following that, she's moved back to Stanford to work with Jose Dini, uh, looking at spatial patterns of gene expression across plant tissues. Um, she's won lots of awards like the, uh, the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship, um, a Burroughs Welcome Fund Career Award at the Scientific Interface and a Chan Zuckerberg Biohub Young Investigatorship. Uh, and I'm really excited to find out more about what she's been doing trying to reprogram developmental things in, in plants. So take it away, Jim. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so I'm interested in engineering plant form because in plants, like in all biological system, form and function are really closely related. And if we can figure out how to engineer form, we can create new and useful plant varieties. On this slide, I'm showing two examples in which humans have already changed the shape of plants. On the top is modern maize, which was bred from its wild ancestor, Teosinte, to increase both the size and the number of seeds that the plant produces. And that's made maize into one of our most productive food crops today. On the bottom is a dwarf rice plant, which helped usher in the green revolution by allowing farmers to apply massive amounts of fertilizer to their fields and get an increase in grain yield instead of just larger straw biomass overall. I'm interested in engineering plant form, not just to create better modern maize varieties, but actually because of how important form is for environmental stress tolerance. So the shape and angle of plants leaves affects photosynthetic efficiency and the plant's ability to tolerate heat stress. Similarly, the structure of the root system affects the plant's ability to obtain water and essential nutrients from the soil. And substructures like these air channels that you can see in the cross section of wetland plants are important for things like submergence tolerance. These air channels actually provide oxygen to the submerged parts of the plants and enable them to survive what would otherwise be hypoxic conditions. Now, I think that engineering form for environmental stress tolerance is going to become more and more important as we see global climate change alter the agricultural 
conditions in which we currently grow the plants that we use for few food, fuel, fibers, and um, medicinal products as well. So as a postdoc, I've been focused on engineering root structure, and I just want to make a plug for roots really quick. I think they're a great system to start out with for engineering development because in part their developmental pathways are really well defined. So we have a good idea of what genes to turn up and turn down in order to change root structure in specific manners. They're also tolerant to pretty extreme mutations. So as an engineer, this is useful to me because I can mess up as I figure out what genes to turn up and turn down and still get plants um, regardless of how severe the developmental mutation I've made um, affects the plant. So here you can see they don't even form roots, but the plant still germinates. So I can get some information out of the engineering that I tried to do. Plants also undergo continuous de novo organogenesis, which means that there are several different developmental stages present on a single plant. So I can look to see how the uh, genes that I've introduced to the plant affect root development um, in a single plant without uh, having to look at multiple plants to see the same kind of developmental time. And then uh, there's very simple cell lineage analysis. So in contrast to mammals, there's no cell migration, which makes it really easy to track cell fates over time. And then probably most importantly, the root form impacts function. So if we can engineer root form, we can immediately have an impact on how easily plants survive in different environments. Okay, so there's three different aspects of root structure that we're trying to engineer. The first is branching rate. This is how many lateral root branches the plant makes per unit of primary root growth. Uh, growth rate, how big is the root system overall after a given period of time? And then branching angle. So once these lateral root branches emerge, what is the angle that they grow to with respect to gravity? And the idea is to control each of these aspects of root structure independently so that we can make very diverse root systems that are potentially optimized for growth in different environments. So phosphorus, for example, resides in the upper levels of soil. And if we wanted to make a plant that was capable of surviving in a low phosphorus environment and was really optimized for scavenging phosphorus from this upper level of soil, what we might want to do is have a root system that's very short but heavily branched so that it was sampling as much of this soil layer as possible. Now, how do you go about engineering root structure? Well, as it turns out, stru engineering structure requires very precise control over gene expression. On this slide, I'm going to show you three examples to illustrate that point. The first is just a wild type plant. So this is an Arabidopsis plant growing on agar media. Arabidopsis is a little bit like the E. coli of the plant world. So um, I'm going to just point out what I think is important about this. Um, the wild type plant has a long primary root that grows down in the direction of gravity, it has several lateral root branches that also grow down in the direction of gravity. And if you zoom in on the plant, you'll see that it's covered in these tiny root hairs, which are actually very important for that water and nutrient acquisition. Now, if you make a single base pair change in this plant and you disrupt this um, developmental regulator IAA14, you can actually make several developmental changes at once. Um, most strikingly, the plant does not produce lateral root branches anymore, but it also has a hard time sensing gravity, which you can tell because the root does not grow straight down. It's also, the primary root is also shorter, and if you were to zoom in, it's missing these lateral root hairs, or these um, root hairs. Now, in part, this mutation has so many effects on the plant's development because it is expressed in several different tissues throughout the plant. It's actually expressed in almost all tissues throughout this plant. Now, if we were to limit expression of this same mutated protein to a single cell type, so in this case, it's the mutant version of the protein being driven by a promoter that is only active in a specific cell type in the root, we can make a really targeted change in plant development. So here, the plant does not produce any lateral roots, which is the targeted change we were trying to make, but it's otherwise identical to the wild type plant on the left side of the slide. So our strategy is to re program root structure using very precise spatial control over gene expression. We've heard a little bit about how you can um, enable spatial control from FD's talk. So you can look for published promoters um, that have been characterized. So in this, um, just showing you an excerpt from a paper where they've actually looked at several different promoter expression patterns in the root tips of Arabidopsis. So there are resources that you can use to express a gene in just the cell types that you're interested in. But if there are no published 
promoters that have the pattern that you want, you might think, okay, I can try to mine promoters from RNA-seq data sets. We unfortunately don't have a comprehensive library in even Arabidopsis of all of the promoter expression patterns. They're a little bit more genomically complex than Mercantia and building that library would be uh, intractable likely. So what you might think you can do is mine promoters from an RNA-seq data set. Um, and that's a good idea, except that it's challenging to implement. So if you were to take the five prime genomic region of a gene that you know is expressed in the plant cell types that you want and fuse it to a fluorescent protein, you may not see the expression pattern that you expect. And this is nicely highlighted um, by this paper where they tried to express, uh, use this ARF7 promoter to express a fluorescent protein. When you take just the five prime genomic region, you actually don't see any expression in the root tip, which is surprising because we know that the ARF7 gene is expressed in, this, in these cell types. If instead you take the five prime genomic region and the first intron and exon of this gene and you fuse that to a fluorescent protein, you then recover the expression pattern that you would expect. And that's because there's information in this intron and exon region that helps um, turn on the promoter in these cell types. So it's non-trivial to just uh, to use RNA-seq data sets to find promoter regions and use them. Okay, so my strategy for overcoming this limitation is actually to build logic gates to control spatial patterns in gene expression. So using logic gates, we can take a limited number of well-characterized promoters and then build out many different expression patterns. And the way that you would do this, I'm showing on the left. So here you have um, promoters that are uh, represented in these cartoons of root tips as these kind of fake green fluorescent protein expression patterns. So this promoter A, for example, would be expressed in the root cap of, um, of the plant. Promoter B would be expressed in this central vascular region and a subset of root cap cells called the columella. And if you were to um, combine these two promoter activities with an AND gate, and an AND gate is only gonna be on when both promoter A and promoter B are present, you'll get expression just in these columella cells. So you'll have built a new expression pattern um, just by using these two promoters as input. And as another plug for logic gates, another thing you might be able to do is to integrate environmental signals with spatial signals so that you can take something like fertilizer inputs and um, combine them using an AND gate to do something like turn on root growth only in response to the environmental signal that you want. Um, so I think that they'll be useful for a number of things. Question is, how do you build logic gates in plants? Well, we're taking a cue here from um, bacterial work in synthetic genetic circuit construction by building out libraries of synthetic transcription factors. So these are both activator and repressor proteins. Now the activator proteins are composed of a DNA binding protein fused to an activation domain and a nuclear localization signal. When these are expressed in plants, they will go into the nucleus and bind the DNA, recruit RNA polymerase and help initiate transcription of whatever gene happens to be downstream. Now the repressor proteins in contrast are just DNA binding proteins fused to nuclear localization signals. When the binding sequence is placed within a promoter that would otherwise recruit RNA polymerase, it should prevent the assembly of the transcription complex and prevent transcription of any downstream gene. Now, all of our synthetic activator and repressor proteins are built with bacterial proteins as the DNA binding region. Um, and we chose to do this because the bacterial proteins have known DNA binding specificity. So we know what sequences they bind and they bind with pretty high affinity, uh, most of them. And that enables us to build out synthetic promoters that are responsive to these synthetic activator proteins just by oligomerizing the binding sites for um, these synthetic activator proteins, we can make activatable promoters or by inserting the binding sequences into what would otherwise be an active promoter. Okay, so how do you test to see whether or not these proteins are active in plants? I'm gonna show you with the synthetic transcriptional activators what we usually do. And actually, um, Quinton laid out this assay nicely. We're gonna use transient expression in tobacco leaves to test for synthetic activator activity. So in this case, we have a plasmid that expresses a synthetic activator and has a promoter that should be responsive to that activator driving expression of GFP. We transform these into an agrobacterium strain and then infiltrate them into plant leaves where the agrobacterium donate DNA into the plant cells. 
Now, if we take a leaf and we infiltrate two different strains onto either side of the leaf, on one side is a strain that has just the synthetic promoter with no activator present, and then the other is a strain where the plasmid contains um, both that synthetic promoter and the synthetic activator, we can compare or look to see how effective the activator is at turning on expression at this synthetic promoter. So here, is a result of what that looks like. You can see that there's no expression of the GFP or without uh, the synthetic activator, but when we add that in, we get nice expression. So that uh, synthetic activator is working. And then we actually on the, all of these plasmids have a constitutively expressed m cherry control that just shows you that the actual infiltration is working nicely. And it's not just that the agrobacterium for some reason wasn't able to deliver this plasmid into the plant cells. Now, we can actually take leaf punches, little hole punches from these leaves, put them at the bottom of 96 well plates and measure fluorescent protein expression in a plate reader and get quantitative information about how well these work. So you can measure GFP, M-cherry, or actually what I'm going to report for the rest of this talk is the ratio of GFP to M-cherry. So this just normalizes GFP expression to uh, how well sort of your um, infiltration assay worked by normalizing to the M-cherry control. Okay, so if we do that, uh, we can test our entire library of synthetic transcriptional activators. Here you're seeing all of the proteins versus all of the promoters, and you'll see that in most cases, the promoters or the synthetic activators are able to turn on expression of their synthetic promoters. Um, and what's exciting about the toolkit that we've built is you can actually do some modifying. So in some cases, maybe the expression of your, um, the expression of your fluorescent protein is not super high, even when your synthetic activator is present in the plant cell. So what you can do is swap out the activation domain. And in this case, we've swapped out VP16, which we were using as our activation domain. That's a segment of a protein from herpes virus for a plant activator, this ERF2 gene, and you can see a massive increase in um, gene expression. So we can do a little bit of fine tuning with these tools um, to get the expression levels that we're interested in. Uh, so although there are some places where the synthetic activators are turning on expression of promoters that maybe they weren't supposed to, we do have a core set of some that are only turning on the promoter that they're supposed to and not cross-reacting with others. And these are actually the proteins that we're going to use to build circuits later. Okay, so we can just do the same thing with transcriptional repressors. I'm going to just really quickly show you that um, we've measured these different synthetic repressors um, ability to repress expression of what is the 35S promoter. So this is a strong viral protein or viral promoter that is active in plants. And um, in some cases we get really nice repression, but again, in others, the repressors don't work as well. And we think that this has to do with the mechanism of repression. Um, so, like I said before, these are just supposed to be interfering with RNA polymerase assembly on the DNA. And um, if we, and for some proteins that works well, but for others it doesn't work quite as well. So, if we add in some synthetic repressive domains, we can again modify these transcription factors so that they are more effective at doing um, what we want them to do, which in this case is repression. Okay, so once we have these synthetic transcriptional activators and repressors, we want to assemble them into logic gates. I'm going to show you really quickly how we do this with one example, um, which is a biological AND gate. So in the corner, you're seeing a truth table. This is going to tell you when we should expect to see expression of our output gene. So our output gene in this case is GFP. We should only see expression when both inputs A and input B are present in the system at the same time. So in the absence of input A and input B, there's no GFP expression. This synthetic promoter that should be expressing it is off in part because there's a constitutively expressed repressor keeping it off. Our input A is gonna be an activator that tries to turn on expression of this pro promoter, but can't because the repressor is epistatic to the um, addition of the activator. Our input B is actually going to be a repressor that turns off expression of the first repressor. But because there's no activator to turn on this promoter, the output is still off. And it's only when you have both input A and input B present at the same time that you get expression of GFP. You can test to see whether or not this AND gate works by the same type of infiltration assay I mentioned before. In this case, we're going to infiltrate four different spots. In the first one is going to be just an output plasmid or a strain harboring the output plasmid. In the second spot is going to be two strains, one with the output plasmid and one with our input um, activator. Then in this spot is output and input B. 
And in the last spot, you have both input A and input B. And when you infiltrate these different combinations of strains into plant leaves, you can see that you get nice GFP expression when you have both input A and input B present in the plant at the same time. And you can quantify or look at the quantification of that data as well. Now, um, in all of these graphs, I'm gonna show you more gates on the next slide. You should have, uh, the black bars um, are <laughs> indicative of states of the gate that should be low and the green bars uh, indicative of a state that should be high. So you can check to see really quickly whether or not the logic gates are working just to make sure that the green bars are high and the black bars are low. Um, so like I said, we can build diverse logic gates in plants. So not just AND gates, but a variety of different logic. Um, and I think that that's really exciting, but obviously expression in plant leaves is not getting us closer to building spatial patterns of gene expression. So instead of using infiltration assays to just see whether or not these logic gates are working, we're actually going to use um, two tissue specific promoters as our inputs for logic gates. And if we combine these two different tissue specific promoters using all 16 different two input logic gates that are possible to build, you can see cartoons of the expected expression patterns and a variety of expression patterns would be possible if we could combine the activity of these two promoters. we we'll talk really quickly about um, these two gates. These are very simple gates um, where you have basically recapitulation of the expression patterns of your input promoters. So in this case, you have promoter A just directly driving expression of GFP as your control. So this is what it should look like. And then your gate actually is where promoter A is driving expression of an activator and that drives expression of GFP. And so you can see really nice um, uh, gate function in this case, but this isn't the case for every promoter. So here we have promoter B, which has a different expression pattern. And actually if we use promoter B in this same setup, we see expression in the cell types we were expecting, but also in a number of other cell types in the plant. What this brings us to is um, a definition of tissue specific that was new to me when I started in plants. So an observed expression pattern um, is just showing you the cell types where the promoter may have highest expression. So promoters are in multicellular organisms are not just tissue specific, they're actually more like tissue enriched. And so if you were to boost the expression level of every um, cell type where that promoter is active, you may actually see that there's expression in other cell types. It's just below your limit of detection with something like a fluorescent protein. And this gate system that we've set up is actually amplifying expression in those cell types. So we know that this is true because if you take a promoter and express GFP using that promoter, you get some level of um, GFP expression. This is in these transient tobacco leaf expression assays. And if you use that same promoter to express an activator that then turns on expression of a fluorescent protein, you see this massive increase in um, GFP expression. So clearly this is amplifying the signal and it's showing you other cell types in which this promoter may be active. Now we can try to do some tuning by changing the number of binding sites for a, um, for a synthetic activator in these promoters so that they're more or less responsive to how much synthetic activator is present in the cell. Here is what this looks like in uh, these transient expression assays. As you increase the number of binding sites, you get an increase in expression levels. Uh, this here is showing you quantitative information. So relative to just the promoter driving GFP, which is our control, you can see we can get both more or less expression of our fluorescent protein. So we think we can use these things to tune gene expression. Actually, I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip through some of the developmental stuff and just show you that like you can use these promoters to try to tune expression of a developmental regulator in plants. Um, we were hoping in this case to see a change in the branching rate as we changed the amount of expression of the developmental regulator in those cell types that I showed you at the beginning of this talk. But actually, even at our lowest promoter expression level, we're still having that developmental impact. So one of the things that we're learning is that in order to change development, you need really small changes in expression levels and just a little bit of a developmental regulator is pretty potent. So we need to go down, not just below the expression, um, or we need to work somewhere in this lower expression level regime. Okay, so um, in addition to these simple A gates, I wanna show you these not implies gates because I think that these are very exciting. 
So not implies gates are on only when one of your promoters is active. So in this case, it's on when promoter A is active. Sorry. Um, and as soon as your input B is present in the system, um, the gate shuts off. So what you can you use this for is to tune expression patterns um, by taking this promoter A, for example, and subtracting out expression uh, where promoter B is active, you get just expression in these kind of lateral root um, cells, which I think will be useful for really fine tuning development. Okay, so that's uh, the logic gates that we've built in plants. You know, we've shown that you can use precise control over gene expression to get precise control over development. You can use logic gates to create new expression patterns in plants. Um, that you can use the activator and repressor domain diversity to tune logic gates and that we need to be careful when we're doing this type of engineering because developmental regulators can have an impact at very low expression levels. So um, from here, we're hoping to use these synthetic genetic circuits to start really fine tuning root growth and to be building these plants that are hopefully optimized for growth in diverse environments. So with that, I wanna thank everybody in the lab that is um, uh, in my postdoc lab that's been really supportive throughout this project. And I will stop sharing. Cool. Thank you very much, Jen. That was absolutely beautiful, beautiful work. I've got one quick question for you, and then I'll, I'll open up things and Emily can take, take the, uh, the floor. Um, there's a question here about some of the characterization data. So are, are these just single point measurements or are you looking at kind of accumulation over time? So some of the rates, I guess, that these processes are actually taking as well. Yeah, these are just single time points. So it's actually three days after we infiltrate these agrobacterium. Um, time measurements like that are a little bit complicated in that the longer you let them sit, you can get more conjugation of DNA into the plant cells, which changes your expression levels or the plant cells, depending on how kind of toxic maybe your things that you're delivering are can start to die. So you get a lot of conflicting um, things influencing your expression levels more than just how, like the dynamics with which the activator turns on expression. Yeah, that's, it's a complicated system <laughs> from the <Yeah>. side. <laughs> but we'd love to do dynamics, that would be great. Yeah, no, for sure. Okay, Emily, I'll hand over to you then. Thanks, um, I will try to summarize some of the questions and I'll work my way from Jen back up um, to Quentin. Um, so, Jen, there were a lot of questions about um, how these synthetic promoters might override endogenous expression in these plants and whether or not, and maybe this comes to what you were just talking about, of whether these um, reflect kind of temporal or spatial expression of these proteins as well. Uh, so I guess is the question, do the gates change native expression patterns? Or? Yeah, so like are, um, are the synthetic gates overriding endogenous gene expression? So the synthetic gates, when they output just GFP, should not be influencing native gene expression. When they're outputting developmental regulators, they are definitely changing a bunch of things within how the plant would normally be expressing genes. Um, we did do a lot of work to try to make sure that the synthetic activators and Pressors would not be interacting with the rest of the plant cells genome so that we don't have an influence on expression. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about it. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then the other question that came up a lot is can these, do you think that these logic transcriptional programs um, could be translated into monocots? Because, you know, <laughs> they're clearly the things we like to eat <laughs> more than Arabidopsis. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question. We haven't done much of that. So we did do transformation of um, some stuff into Ceteria. I don't have data for that just because it, it takes a really long time to get monocot transgenics. And I think that there's no reason conceptually that these wouldn't work, but they would probably be need to be redesigned so that they would be expressed well in monocots. The activation domains um, may work differently there, even the, the synthetic promoters. So the, well, I actually think that they would work 
pretty well, but we would need to, to test it to be sure. Yeah. And then the last question that I'll ask you is if these logic transcription programs occur naturally in plants, or is this like purely um, kind of man-made? Yeah. So um, promoters that are turned on and off by multiple transcription factors are doing logic in plants all the time, right? So this is how you get really find expression patterns. You have promoters that are expressing your genes responding to transcription factors that may be on and off in a bunch of different cell types, but the combination of those two, of all those things gives you expression just in the cell types that that gene should be turned on in. So for sure they're doing um, some biological computation. They're obviously not doing it with the same type of tools that we have because these are from bacteria. Um, but I think we can learn a lot from those native um, logic gates, if you want to call it that, to build some more robust synthetic versions in the future. Great. Um, okay, so I'll move on to Aptikus. Um, Thanks. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, there were a lot of questions about how these screens in Marcantia can be scaled up. Can it be scaled up to larger plants? Um, can it be scaled up um, into crops, for example? Um, are these transcriptional factors um, related or can they be related to other um, plants than, than Marcantia? Oh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> yes, so the same uh, families of transcription factors that are found in Marcantia are also present in other plants. They're a bit more uh, uh, numerous, they have more members but uh, there is a lot there are examples of conservation of things that are happening in mercantia are happening in crops or in uh, in angiosperm for example so we believe that yes you can scale up those things but we haven't uh, uh, reached that level yet but yes in theory yeah yeah um likewise um there were some questions about whether these tools could be tested in other types of um in other types of plants particularly fiscomitrella yeah, uh, yes. So we've already tested them in homewards, for example, and they work mm -hmm. nicely and uh, in other systems like Arabidopsis. And um, uh, I say yes, they can also be used in fiscal material. Actually, I've, I've used in fiscal material in the past, and uh, I know all the level zero parts we have can be of use. Uh, fiscal material uh, does homologous recombination, so you can just modify the system a little bit to adapt it, adapt it to fiscal material. So yes, mm -hmm. you can use those things. Do you anticipate particular steps that would have to be taken so that you could modify these types of screens in other types of plant systems, maybe more complex vascular plants, things like that? I think the, the main challenge will be how to visualize those things because in Marcantia, as uh, you've seen, you, you can do everything in this gem that is flat and very open. So I would imagine the main challenge is to access these developmental stages in more, uh, uh, complex systems. Mm. Excellent, thanks. I think that, that that was a lot of the kinds of questions that were on there. Tom, if you see anything extra that you think I'm missing, please. Uh, I think you're, you're capturing the jump in the, the, the sort of questions as groups, which is good, which is really, really good. I have some broader questions that I was intrigued to ask all of you. And maybe I can do it now, actually. Is, but I'm I, I'm not a plant biologist, but why why should I be really excited about all this plant synthetic biology? What what gets you up in the morning and gets you really excited about what you're doing in your lab? So I don't know, Quinton, do you want to give us an insight into your daily routine as a plant synthetic biologist? <laughs> um, I, I've always been really just motivated by you know plants are can take carbon out of the air with and with light and make stuff from it, and you know. Um, I mean, the, the conventional metabolic engineering, you know, that sugar that, that we're feeding um, to engineer bacteria and yeast, you know, that, that all comes from plants. So like, what if we can put it all in, in the same unit? It, it almost makes its own bioreactor. Uh, if you will, we can distribute them with seeds. Like uh, the, the future vision of manufacturing with plants, I think has, has a lot of appeal. Um, but day to day, I think it's just the, the metabolism is really complex and really cool. Um, I mean, you look at that 29 step path when it's like, how does it happen? That's really impressive. So, so do you think at some point I'm going to, I'm going to be able to order on Amazon 
a, a plant for, I don't know, some medicine, and I literally grow it in my window and then eat it? Is this kind of your vision for where we might be in the future? I don't know. Someone someone asked me once, like, so can I just, like, take some catharanthus tea and, like, treat my cancer? Like, ah, I'd prefer <laughs> not to do that. Uh, dose, dose determines the poison, right? Um, so I think in our early applications, you know, a lot of it's going to be fitting into our conventional medicines, at least, um, extracting. But, you know, the, we're going to things won't be as expensive. We'll be able to make things on demand. I think that's what, you know, just planting more seeds is a lot easier than scaling up bioreactors. Sure. But I can pass the, the question still to, to the other two. Yeah. So yeah, F FT, what, what's your views and like, what, why is plant synthetic biology so exciting as a, as a field? So in general, I think plants, uh, I think this is how I was starting my presentation when I was a PhD student, but uh, we're here discussing about these things because plants colonize the earth, <laughs> the, the land. <laughs> and uh, I really um, uh, like bryophytes in particular, of course, uh, because they have a lot of potential and there are very beautiful examples of Fiscometrella, for example, where you can grow the, the plant in, uh, in bioreactors and produce uh, very useful uh, uh, compounds that are for, uh, for me medical reasons. Maybe I have an overdose of coronavirus news, that's why <laughs> the first example comes to my mind. <laughs> and then Jen, have you got any unique insights? Are you coming about it from a different way or, or, or is it sim similar kind of, uh, kind of motivations, I guess? Uh, yeah, I think it's similar to what they've already said. Uh, I personally got interested in this or get excited about it because I'm a little bit more of a visual person. When I was working on my PhD, I got really excited about all the different weird colony morphologies that soil bacteria have when you grow them out. And plants is just a whole other level of being able to kind of tangibly see the effects of your engineering in macro scale, which to me is just so exciting, you know. Yeah, it's super cool. It's super cool. Yeah. I liked what Jen said about um, Arabidopsis being the E. coli of plants, because when I was studying, when I started working in plants as a PhD student, um, I used to say in my introductions that plants were the bulb C mouse of, of you oh. know, the Arabidopsis was just like the mouse model um, for that. And also to remind people that plants are eukaryotes too. And so there are lots of conserved um, especially on the molecular and the cellular level, there are lots of conserved mechanisms that occur in us as well as in plants. So, um, and as Quentin said too, I mean, plants are the medicine, I mean, we get most of our medicine from plants. So, you know, it's not just food and clean water and clean air, it's medicine as well. And it's, um, and they're just cool. They are cool. Um, as a root biologist, I also agree that looking at how cells grow and change over time is really useful because they're stuck. They're stuck where they are. They can't move on you. So yeah, they're a great model system. Um, yeah, totally. totally agree with all of you. Um, Quinton, I have some questions for you. Um, there were a lot of questions about how much um, of plant metabolism is, is known. And if um, knocking out one or two of these um, pathways or, or um, intermediates could cause a lot of problems kind of down the line? Um, well, I think uh, overall plant metabolism is still a big black box. I mean, there's so many, you know, there, there's plant gene duplications have resulted in, you know, 126 you I call transferase and benthamiana alone, you know, and that's what made this project so challenging is how do we down select those candidates. Um, but I think, you know, we're not too worried about a lot of the knockouts since so many, you know, a lot of these enzymes are potentially, you know, involved in specialized or secondary metabolite production, um, which, you know, those, you know, knocking those out could definitely decrease fitness of these plants in the, in the wild. Um, but, you know, you know, if they're making a, a secondary metabolite, you know, you're still going to get a viable plant. Um, that said, you know, some uh, are going to be involved maybe in, in development. Um, and again, we, I don't think we're still at the, the stage where we can, you know, predict, we don't have the data sets to predict uh, which, which uh, knockouts are going to be deleterious. Um, at the beginning of the project, I was doing, you know, as we picked candidates, I would try and line them up to Arabidopsis homologs and see if there's, you know, a, a tDNA line that, 
at shows and you know generally I, I could find one so um I think uh, in terms of viable uh Benthamiana for single or double knockouts we're going to be okay but maybe the the ultimate optimized plant's going to require more than that and then you know maybe we'll see some of these overlapping effects that we just don't know about yet yeah um and kind of coming back to what you were saying about how we can't necessarily just grow a medicinal plant and eat it and expect um <laughs> expect something to happen um what's the purification for some of these substrates like do you have to worry about unwanted products or do you have to account for extra purification steps um, if you're looking for a really small component of this huge huge metabolic process yeah i mean for for our research scale stuff i mean we're doing a lot of the you know, column separation on our hplc before we're doing our, our mass spec um, and I, actually that that's an interesting segue to a, a side project that i'm working on um, which, you know, the, the most famous alkaloid that tobacco makes, of course, is nicotine. Um, and so, you know, if you were trying to do some simple extraction, you know, acid-base extraction, all you're going to get is the nicotine. Um, so we're working with uh, another group to see if we can uh, knock out nicotine biosynthesis in these mm -hmm. plants. So then you'd have, you know, you'd at least remove that uh, contaminant, if you will, and maybe open up the options for simpler uh, purification strategies. Mm -hmm. And could particular types of tissues be used to help increase this type of production? Yeah, and I mean, the, the vision of, you know, the full 29-step pathway, you know, really might take some interesting tissue-specific engineering. I mean, in Catharanthus, this pathway is localized over, you know, three different organelles, three to four different tissue type or uh, cell types, um, and the plant has for some reason, you know, maybe by chance or by, you know, for, for a good reason, compartmentalized itself that way. So, um, uh, so far, you know, we can get to strictosteine, you know, mostly in the cytoplasm of, of the, the tobacco cells, but, you know, maybe we'll need some, something like that uh, for, for future engineering. Um, but again, that I think will, developing those tools will, will open up lots of exciting applications. Mm. Awesome. I think that was pretty much all I pulled out in terms of um, kind of the main, the main um, questions on people's minds. Um, okay. I, have, I think you... that's probably a good point to kind of maybe start to wrap things up. I always, I always have one more question because I always have way too many questions and not enough time. But I'm, I'm kind of intrigued because, because it's a little bit outside my area of expertise. And you kind of, a, a lot of you sort of hinted at difficulties in your like, in getting things working. Are there in these different areas that you spoke about, is there kind of one, I don't know, if, if at Christmas you were given a gift, what would it be that would really help you accelerate what you're doing? Is there one, are they similar between these different areas or are there quite different challenges that you will face in terms of getting some of this stuff to work? Um, so I don't know, Jen, have you got, a, you're first on my list, but have you got any ideas for difficult problems or challenges that you think need to be overcome? Definitely. Uh, for my work specifically, where we're really trying to tune expression levels, the fact that tDNAs or, or any DNA that you deliver into a plant cell randomly integrates into the genome is the biggest barrier to making quick progress. So every single plant, like a seed that you get that's transformed is different from every other seed that you get, which makes it challenging to know, okay, well, is this different because of my promoter or is it different because it landed in a different location? And the way that plant biologists get around this is just by averaging over many different independent lines. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that averaging makes your error bars on things really large and difficult to kind of do some fine tuning of expression. So for Christmas, I want a site-specific integration platform. Well, I don't know if someone might be listening. You never know. So <laughs> see what happens. Okay. Yeah, Santa. <laughs> Actually, have you got have you got any ideas? For, yeah, it's this, the for same problem. It's, it's the same the same thing. Yeah, I want the same uh, gift for Christmas. That <laughs> the same one. Is it so? We can it, share. Yeah, you can share. It. So, is, so really, it's, is it the, the actual genomic engineering then that's really difficult for, for these plants? And that, that's the thing, if you can get over that in a way, that would solve a lot of these issues. It's case specific. So sometimes it's very straightforward and sometimes, you know, you hit something and then it's very hard to troubleshoot. 
So it's uh, it's not that it's like something that you have on a daily basis, but uh, it's 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 not non frequent. <laughs> Yeah, that's very. In Quinton, is there any any other things that you you struggle with day to day? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, being in the metabolism space, that's where my my head goes. I mean, it's a synthetic biology uh, discussion. So, I mean, as you think of that design, build, test, learn cycle, I mean, for metabolites, having to use you know HPLC and 20, 30 minute run times per sample means your your throughput at the test phase is is limited, and. So, but I'm really closely looking at, you know, ideas for how to connect a meta presence or absence of a metabolite to something that is more high throughput. Is that, you know, um, robotic handling? Is that, um, you know, bacterial sensors that specifically respond to your metabolite? And so you got an E. coli with a sensor growing in your 96 well plates. Is that a uh, transcriptional readout? So we can use next gen sequencing. Um, I mean, we just need those uh, transducers to link those two outputs. Um, cause I think FD talks really well about, you know, we have these new assembly, uh, pipelines that, you know, we can build lots of combinations. Um, we just need to figure out what they do and get bigger data sets to, un uh, you know, uh, uncouple this complexity. So sensing. I think that's, uh, to be honest, I, I think that's probably a, uh, a problem across the whole of synthetic biology is our throughput. If you can up that, then it saves a lot of time and it op opens up a lot of um, learning that you can get from the, the systems and stuff. But I think that's a really good place to end it. So I just want to thank so much all of the speakers. I thought it was, it was really fascinating to see all the different aspects of plant biology and, and, and synthetic biology that you're working on. And I also really want to thank Emily as well. I think you did an awesome job in fielding the questions and Somehow I was looking at the slider and there's, there's questions all over the place. So I don't know how you did that, which is, which is really good. And yeah, thank everyone for hanging on till the end. And, um, and yeah, we'll, we have these every month. So please, yeah, tune in. It's, it's an it's a open session. And, um, and yeah, thank you for coming and, and hope to see some of you again. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>